consider thinking about uh, some of these things about Daniel. So Jeremiah chapter 42 through 44 this morning. Jeremiah 42 through 44, we referenced this text actually uh, in, on a Wednesday night back earlier in January, and uh, it's been kind of on the radar, and then if you've been enjoying the feature this week, you're going to uh, be in some very familiar territory as we've had a few days here in the a portion of this text. The Lord laid it on my heart to study it a bit more and to uh, enjoy it together as we consider uh, our theme uh, for this year, wanting to break down the high places and, and to battle to make war with the enemy, not making peace with the enemy, but rather to fight where we're called to fight, making sure that we fight the right enemy. Satan's our enemy. But if uh, people align themselves with Satan from God's perspective, they're the enemy, even though he loves them, and even though we should love them, we need to uh, be willing to stand strong, stand, stand true, speak truth in love in a gracious manner toward, towards those who would oppose our God. Jeremiah chapter 42, we're going to read uh, this portion and we'll catch uh, a portion of chapter 43 and then we'll pray and dive in here. Jeremiah 42, then all the commanders of the forces, so what's going on here, uh, Nebuchadnezzar has conquered Jerusalem, they laid siege to it. Laying siege to a city means you surround it and you cut off all of its ability to uh, gain supplies, food. Farm, farmland would be outside the city, of course, so you can't go work in your fields and get more food. Water supplies, uh, very critical. Uh, if they have a water source, a river flowing into the city, they could cut it off and shorten your water supply, and so it's a more matter of time before people die or surrender. That's the strategy, right? Uh, with that, they're also cutting off forms of communication. So you can't call for help from another portion of the country, uh, another brigade, another platoon or whatever, or another country at times. Very often they would seek other country for protection, be it from the north, Assyria, uh, Syria, um, others down south, Egypt. So they're, they would lay siege. They'd literally, literally surround the city and try to starve you out to thirst you out, flush you out, to surrender. So he did that. He did that to Jerusalem. It worked. Um, the Bible says that during this time it was so bad that people were actually eating their children. Uh, they were that hungry. Let that sink in for a second. That's awful. That's as bad as you, not one of us could even get our brains to go there. Can't even imagine it. Don't want to. It's but that's how hungry they were. And God warned them that it would be this way if they turned their heart against him and served other gods. God said, I am going to work against you. I'm going to fight against you. I will pour out my wrath. And that's the term that's used. Even though we have a loving God, his love is for purity, holiness. And if you align yourself with Satan then he's going to actively work against you in order to bring reconciliation, in order to bring you back, in order to bring repentance and restoration uh, in your relationship with him. And so really, the God working his wrath, his judgment against his own creation, believe it or not, is an act of mercy. It doesn't seem like it in the moment, but it is. God loves us enough to not let us alone. He loves us enough to not let us self-destruct, at least without throwing out a lifeline. We can self-destruct, but he doesn't just let us self-destruct without throwing out a lifeline. So God had warned the Israelites, hey, you, I'm going to work against you if you worship other gods. They didn't heed the warning. God sent, as he often did during these days, he would use different means to get their attention, be it famine, uh, be it an enemy coming in, and that's the what he was using in this case, actually working in tandem. He brought the um, Chaldeans, the Babylonians, present-day Iraq. He brought them in. And Nebuchadnezzar came in with his armies, conquered Jerusalem, and 
um, carried many of them captive into uh, back into uh, Babylon, the capital of uh, the nation there, including in that um, group that was taken captive was Daniel. We'll talk about him in a few moments. Nebuchadnezzar then allowed a governor, a Jew, a Jew, to govern that area of Jerusalem and Judea under his authority. So there was a guard established by Nebuchadnezzar there to maintain control, but he, he actually allowed a Jew to be the governor, know the language, know the people, an act of peace and, and trying to work with each other in this realm. And what happened is uh, he was a good guy. In fact, he had saved Jeremiah's life. His name was Gedaliah. He had saved Jeremiah's life some, some years before. Uh, so he's a trusted man. He loved and feared God. Uh, but there was a group of individuals who came and had their own agenda, and they actually assassinated this governor. This man then had um, a few men, but he, was, he actually killed 80 other Jews that were coming. He tricked them into coming to Gadaliah, the governor. In the meantime, he killed 80 of them, threw them in a cistern. This is all in the chapters leading up to Jeremiah 42 here. And there was a man that came and confronted this man, and his name was Jehonan. We're going to pick up in, in chapter 42, and we're going to see his name there. But in, in chapter 41, verse 11, Jehonan comes, and he actually fights this bad guy, is able to recapture many that had followed them. So this, this bad guy had threatened to kill more people. Uh, and so they surrendered because they, had, they said, hey, don't kill us. We have food and livestock and honey that we've hid in the fields and stuff. If you'll keep us alive, we'll share. And so that was, remember, there's, they've been in a famine because of, the, uh, because of the Chaldeans, right? Nebuchadnezzar's surrounded them, taken all their crops for themselves to feed their own army while they're laying siege. And so this would be a real appeal to this bad guy. Hey, we got some food and supplies. We'll keep you alive. So he, he has this little following then jo Jehonan comes, and he starts to whoop up on this bad guy. And those that had asked this bad guy to save and spare their lives actually join with Jehonan to fight against him. The bad guy flees with eight people. So we come then towards the end of chapter 41, and Jehonan and the company are afraid because they think that Nebuchadnezzar is going to look at the situation, the guy that he appointed to be governor there under his authority has been assassinated. And you dirty Jews, I'm trying to work with you and you're spitting in my face, forget it, let's wipe them all out. That, that's what their fear is. They're few in number, they're very vulnerable, they have no army, they have little provisions, and so they're afraid. And so these folks are thinking to head down to Egypt, let's get out of here. It's not safe in Jerusalem anymore. Certainly, we don't want to be taken captive over into Babylon. They're going to treat us badly there. Let's go down to Egypt. Plenty of provisions, safety from a different government, a different king who's strong, they think. Actually, Nebuchadnezzar is going to defeat the king of uh, Egypt as well. And so there's a lot of wrestlings going on. We come to chapter 42 then. It says this, Then all the commanders of the forces and Jehonan, the son of Korea, and Jezaniah, the son of Hoshiah, and all the people from the least to the greatest came near. So this is Jehonan and all his little company now. Came near and said to Jeremiah the prophet, Let our plea for mercy come before you and pray to the Lord your God for us, for all this remnant. What does remnant mean? Those that remain, the few, yep. The few that remain is the idea here. Because we are left but with but a few as your eyes see us. And here's what they want him to pray. Pray that the Lord your God may show us the way we should go and the thing we should do. Oh, well, that's a pretty reasonable request. Just show me where we're supposed to go, what we're supposed to do. Jeremiah the prophet said to them, I have heard you. Behold, I will pray to the Lord your God according to your request. And whatever the Lord answers you, I will tell you. I will keep nothing back from you. Then they said to Jeremiah, May the Lord be a true and faithful witness against us if we do not act according to all the word which the Lord your God sends you to us. Whether it is good or bad, we will obey the voice of the Lord our God to whom we are, to whom we are sending you. 
that it may be well with us when we obey the voice of the Lord our God. At the end of ten days, when the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, then he summoned Jehonan, the son of Korea, and all the commanders of the forces which were with him, all the people from the least to the greatest, said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, to whom you sent me to present your plea for mercy before him, If you will remain in this land, then I will build you up and not pull you down. I will plant you and not pluck you up. Far relent of the disaster that, notice, I did to you. Now, he used Nebuchadnezzar, but it was God working against them through Nebuchadnezzar. God is taking credit for it. I did this. I'm trying to get your attention. And I relent. I'm easing up. Verse 11, do not fear the king of Babylon, of whom you are afraid. Do not fear him, declares the Lord, for I am with you to save you and to deliver you, deliver you from his hand. I will grant you mercy that he may have mercy on you. Isn't that an interesting way to, to phrase that? I will grant you mercy that he may have mercy on you. He's going to actually demonstrate his mercy through working in Nebuchadnezzar's heart and creating compassion and mercy in his heart towards these people that rightfully he could kill, <laughs> right? So I will grant you mercy that he may have mercy on you and let you remain in your own land. But if you say we will not remain in this land, disobeying the voice of the Lord your God and saying, no, we will go to the land of Egypt where we shall not see war or hear the sound of the trumpet or be hungry for bread and we will dwell there. Then hear the word of the Lord, O remnant of Judah. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, if you set your faces to enter Egypt and go to live there, then the sword that you fear shall overtake you and there in the land of Egypt. And the famine of which you are afraid shall follow close after you to Egypt, and there you shall die. All the men who set their faces to go to Egypt to live there shall die by the sword, by famine, by pestilence, and they shall have no remnant or survivor from the disaster that I will bring upon them. Pestilence, what's that? Anyone heard of COVID? Isn't pestilence a disease? And that very closely associates often with famine, death, and other such things. Verse 18, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. By the way, I'm not saying that this was COVID <laughs> here back in, in this time. I'm just saying we know what a pestilence is. We, we're experiencing it right now. Again, verse 18, for thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, as my anger and my wrath, you notice those words? As my anger and my, my wrath were poured out on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so my wrath will be poured out on you when you go to Egypt. You shall become an execration. What's that? It's a curse. You shall become an execration, a horror, a curse, and a taunt. You shall see this place no more. In other words, you're not, you won't be able to come back to, to Jerusalem, to Israel. The, Lord's, the Lord has said to you, O remnant of Judah, do not go to Egypt. Know for a certainty that I have warned you this day, that you have gone astray at the cost of your lives. For you sent me to the Lord your God, saying, Pray for us to the Lord our God, and whatever the Lord our God says, declare to us, and we will do it. And I have this day declared it to you, but you have not obeyed the voice of the Lord your God in anything that he sent me to tell you. Now therefore, know for a certainty that you shall die by the sword, by famine, and by pestilence in the place where you desire to go and live. So apparently there was some conversation that's not recorded in the Bible for us. Jeremiah knew of their intentions. Maybe it was something that was discovered in prayer. God was revealing what they were thinking and what their plans were even before there was that communication. Let's just read a few more verses in chapter 43. When Jeremiah finished speaking to all the people, all these words of the Lord their God, which the Lord their God had sent him to, to them, Azariah the son of Hoshiah and Jehonan the son of uh, Korea, and all the insolent men, what's insolent mean? Arrogant and proud. All these arrogant, proud, insolent men said to Jeremiah, you are telling a lie. The Lord our God did not send you to say, do not go to Egypt to live there, but Barak, the son of Neriah, has set you against us. Who's Barak? That's Jeremiah's scribe. 
So as God spoke and commanded Jeremiah to, to document these things, he would speak as his scribe would write it down. It was his companion. They did ministry together. And so these guys knew it and they say, no, your scribe is actually telling you what to say. So, but Barak, the son of Neriah, has sent you against us to deliver us into the hand of the Chaldeans, that's the, the folks from Babylon, that they may kill us or take us into exile in Babylon. So Jehonan, the son of Korea, and all the commanders of the forces and all the people did not obey the voice of the Lord to remain in the land of Judah. But Jehonan, the son of Korea, and all the commanders of the forces took all the remnant of Judah who had returned to live in the land of Judah from all the nations to which they had been driven, the men, women, children, the, pri the princesses, and every person whom Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, had left with Gadaliah, the son of Hiakim, son of Japh uh, Shaphan, also Jeremiah the prophet and Barak the son of Neriah. Jeremiah and Barak go with them down to Egypt. So is Jeremiah disobeying? No. It appears that God wanted him to go down to continue to give confrontation to those who had sinned against him by going down to Egypt. So God is yet giving them another chance. Uh, verse 7. And they came into the land of Egypt, for they did not obey the voice of the Lord, and they arrived in Tapanes. All right, let's take a moment and pray and ask God to bless our study. Father, this text is not overly fun to uh, read and study. Nobody likes Debbie Downer days. Uh, nobody likes to be a negative Nelly. Uh, it's not fun to, to look at people's failures. It's not fun to speak of your judgment, your wrath and anger, and justice being carried out upon those who are living in rebellion against you. And yet, Father, as people who wrestle with our own rebellion, our own sinful hearts, our hearts that are prone to wander, Lord, from time to time we need to examine these texts to allow your word to confront areas of our hearts where we are yet uh, in rebellion. It's so easy for us to think that we're right with you. Uh, we know the right things to say. Uh, we know the right things to pray. But very often we come to the situation with our own baggage, with our own uh, fears, our own minds made up. And so, Father, we ask that you would use this text in our hearts to purify us, uh, to prepare us to be a people that are obedient, uh, ready to do your bidding. Along with that, then, uh, ready to experience you in fresh new ways in this year, ready to uh, see you work in glorious ways in saving souls and changing families and saving marriages and saving wayward children and uh, wayward aunts and uncles or family members or co-workers or other such things. And so, Father, we just pray that you would uh, do your work in our midst, especially uh, with the changes in our country now, as we still see such stark division and anger and animosity, as we hear threats of silencing, uh, reprogramming, and, and just very scary terminology, we ask, Lord, that you would raise within our own hearts a resolve, a holy resolve like Daniel, to obey you. May we purpose in our hearts to resolve in our hearts to obey you no matter what. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I came across a... Uh, a short little devotional that um, was a blessing to my own heart, and I just wanted to take, it's just a couple paragraphs. From Daniel 1.8 was what it was being commented on. Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself. Remember, Daniel is a contemporary with these folks, Jehonan and all the folks that are in Jeremiah. Uh, they were living at the same time, going through many of the same experiences. So Daniel was taken to Nebuchadnezzar. For whatever reason, Nebuchadnezzar allowed these folks to remain there. And the reason was that they were very poor, is what the Bible tells us. They had no, nothing to offer uh, their kingdom over there in, in Babylon. And so he let a few stay there. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. You know the story well, taken from Daniel 1. And here's what was written. Our English word purpose, so Daniel purposed in his heart, our English word purpose derives from an old Anglo-French verb meaning to propose. 
You know that term, huh, ladies? The guy pops the question. When a man proposes marriage to a woman, he says, it is my purpose to spend my life with you and with none other. The advantage of such a proposal as it transitions to a life purpose is that it eliminates a multitude of decisions that might present themselves. So, for those of you who are married, there are many opportunities because you know other men or women. But because we purpose in our hearts to be faithful to one, those other opportunities, those other variables, those other things, the other people, they're not even an option, right? They shouldn't be, and that's what he's going to stay here, state here in a moment. So let me read, read that again. The advantage of such a proposal as it transitions to a life purpose is that it eliminates, eliminates a multitude of decisions that might present themselves. Anything that conflicts with one's purpose in life is not even considered, or it shouldn't be. When young Daniel was taken as a captive to Babylon, he purposed in his heart not to defile himself in the pagan land. So he proposed, he suggested, he asked uh, to the one in charge an alternative to the diet he was offered. So obviously the Jews weren't allowed to eat certain foods. They were offering him foods that would have been considered illicit from God's perspective for his people. So he said, hey, uh, Daniel, purpose in his heart, I'm not going to disobey God. It's not an option. So he's asking his authorities, can we eat something else, right? So when young Daniel was taken uh, as captive to Babylon, he purposed in his heart not to defile himself. He proposed to the one in charge an alternative to the diet he was offered. He didn't, he didn't have to wonder, what shall I do? That decision ha had been made before God many years before. His purpose was to live a life of purity and obedience to God. That was a great little hit, quick hit, wasn't it? When we purpose in our heart, and we should, we should purpose in our heart now to obey God, to love Him, to fear Him, no matter what comes, so that when the crisis arises, we don't, have, we don't even have to think about it. To sin is not an option. To deny Christ is not an option. To hate others is not an option, even if they are contrary to God's thinking, God's ways. It's not an option. We have to treat others with respect. That's true externally. That's true in our marriages. That's true in our homes. It's true in our work relationships. Certain things are just aren't even an option. So we need to purpose in our hearts now to obey when it's easy. To obey in the little things now, because if we're not obeying now, we certainly won't in the big things, especially when the screws are, are put on, the pressure comes. Right? I say all this because these individuals, as we read in chapter 42, knew all the right words to say, didn't they? And, and to be fair, it seems like these folks had good intentions. They meant well. May I ask you a question before we get going here? Let me ask you three questions. And don't answer it out loud, of course, but... Are you committed to obeying God unconditionally? Not just today, but every day, in every quiet moment when no one else is around, or in the very noisy moment when there's a lot of pressure from outsiders, when your friends are around, and when you speak up about that dirty joke, or you state truth, biblical truth, to disarm lies. Are you committed to obeying God unconditionally? Are you committed to obeying God completely? Remember, this is part of our theme as we were in 1 Kings. So we were excited that Jehoshaphat had obeyed the Lord in so many ways. He had done a lot of things of casting down uh, idols and such things, and yet it says that he did not tear down the high places, and he also made peace with the enemy, right? He made peace with the king of, of Israel. God's not interested in partial obedience. Partial obedience is disobedience. He wants all. It's all or nothing. So are you committed to obeying God completely? 
as God defines it, by the way. Are you committed to obeying God continually? We all want to say yes. We all do say yes. We love God. We're thankful for our salvation given to us through Jesus Christ. Uh, we realize that we are citizens of heaven first and foremost, that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life. We want to please the Lord. And we have in our hearts a desire to obey God unconditionally, completely, continually. But we fail every day, don't we? We get angry. We're harsh with our words. We're selfish. Uh, just a, a plethora of things in our own hearts and character. We're not like Christ, and we want to be. We know the right things to say. We say them. We even pray them. But man, when the rubber meets the road, when reality hits, when it actually comes home to roost in our lives, wow, it is so easy to fail, right? And so this, as we're entering into our year with this theme, wanted to take a few moments to set us up for success instead of repeating failure after failure year after year. These folks prayed with good intentions. Do you see that there? No doubt they had good intentions. We don't know their hearts, but they seem very sincere. So they're asking in verse 3, they're asking Jeremiah to go and pray, to, to intercede on their behalf with God. In verse 3, they requested that the Lord, would, uh, your God, may show us the way we should go, the thing we should do. That's pretty straightforward. We just need to know where to go, what to do. Sure. Verse 6, here's their words. In fact, verse 5, they're, they're earnest in this. They say, may the Lord be a true and faithful witness against us. We can go to court, so to speak. That's, it's courtroom terminology. May the Lord be a true and faithful witness against us if we don't obey, is what they're saying, right? If we do not act according to all the word, remember complete obedience, all the word which the Lord your God sends to us. And then verse 6, it says, whatever is good or whether it is good or bad, and that's from man's perspective. God never sends something bad. It's always good. So from man's perspective, they're saying even if it's distasteful, if it's unwanted, if it's scary, whatever it may be, whether it's good or bad, i.e. to us, we will obey the voice of the Lord our God to whom we are sending you. Why? What's, what's every person's desire? That it may be well with us when we obey the voice of the Lord our God. So they had some some basic scriptural understanding here. God says, if you obey me and, and surrender to my will, uh, worship me alone, I will bless you. If you don't, I will work against you. That's how it works, right? And so they, they understand these things, and they're praying it. And they're, they seem genuine. They have good intentions. Like them, we desire the mercy and leading of God. That's all that they're asking for. The mercy and leading of and we would use the word, the blessing then, of God. They recognized that their nation had been conquered. They needed God's blessing and protection. Uh, their world's been turned upside down. Their resources were limited. They had little food. Uh, obviously, there weren't even many pack animals with that. They would eat animals before they would eat other such things that we mentioned. Uh, obviously, they've mentioned their few in number, their sin in the ranks. One of their own had murdered, assassinated the guy that the governor that uh, Nebuchadnezzar had established to rule over them. And no doubt they're, they're thinking Nebuchadnezzar is going to be mad. We've, we've, we've kicked the hornet's nest. Lord, please, please be merciful. Show us. These are tender times we live in. Don't know what to do. These are game changers. Lord, help. That's legitimate. Man, these folks seem pretty spiritual. These folks seem much like us, Right? In fact, by the way, God records these stories for us, not for us to look down our nose at them and point a finger at them, but rather for us to engage in the story and see ourselves in it. Yeah, yeah, I, I might be one of those. The good parts, the bad parts, yeah, I'm like one of those, right? We're not casting stones here. We're saying, yeah, I'm capable of that sin. Why? Because I'm capable of fear. I'm capable of self-preservation. I love my children, and I don't want them to be hurt or harmed or abused. My wife. We can identify with this. These are real tensions that these folks, these real folks, engaged in. They were sincere. They desired the mercy and leading of God. 
Like them, we seek the will and way of God. In fact, they're earnest in it in that they are actually going to pursue the counsel of their spiritual leader. Here's a prophet. He's, they're doing the right things. They're taking the right steps. Don't know what to do. Hey, Prophet Jeremiah, would you go talk to God for us? We know he hears you. Sure. And they, we see they're committed to obey the word of God. Whatever the Lord says, all of the, wor the word of the Lord will obey it. The Lord can be witness against us. He can hold us accountable, right? So the, they prayed. We often pray in crisis moments with good intentions. Notice then, as we move on, we wait with our brains engaged, and we should. We pray. Does God often answer us the first time we pray? Don't you wish that were the case? Oh, man. We could save ourselves a whole lot of heartache and headache. We could stay out of a whole lot of trouble if God would just verbally, would be nice, talk to us in a voice that we could understand, show us in highlighted, glowing uh, terms in Scripture exactly what I'm supposed to do, where I'm supposed to go, what I'm supposed to say, how I'm supposed to react. Boy, that'd be so nice. But God doesn't usually work that way, does he? In fact, we don't hear audible voices these days. The Bible says that revelation is complete. He does not conduct himself, speak in ways that he did in former times. We do not have prophets these days. You're stuck with pastors. <laughs> far, far, far inferior to prophets. Uh, God spoke directly to the prophets. He told them what to write. They, it's recorded scripture for all eternity. Your pastor, fallible. Not recorded for eternity, thankfully. We often have to wait when we pray. And very often it's during that waiting time that we get ourselves into trouble. We start off all good, we're doing well, we're committed. But then God has us sit on our haunches. Sit still. Be still and know that I am God. And it's fascinating. Do you remember uh, in 2 Chronicles with Hezekiah? Actually, he was dealing with uh, the Babylon Babylonians as well. God had uh, caused him to be sick. He had just, Hezekiah was a great king, done mighty great things. Uh, Sennacherib, uh, if you were around when uh, Pastor Bill Martin was here, uh, he always called Sennacherib snack on ribs. Sennacherib was the bad king from the north, came down, and he was threatening the Jews to kill him. And he actually had his commanders tell the Jews to deny God and just surrender. And Hezekiah, being the good king, said, don't listen to them. We can't deny God. Let's stay true. And he went and consulted Isaiah, the prophet, prayed, and, got, and Isaiah, through, uh, God communicated to Isaiah, God's going to fight the battle. And God did. He, he routed uh, Sennacherib, he went away defeated. Uh, I can't remember, 120,000 or something like that, destroyed by God's hand, not by man's. Just fantastic stuff. I think he caused them to fight each other, actually. Right after that victory, Hezekiah got sick, and he prayed to the Lord in bitterness of spirit, actually, and God granted him 15 more years to live. Do you remember this story? As he recovered then, Nebuchadnezzar sent an uh, uh, envoy to see how, maybe it wasn't Nebuchadnezzar, Babylon sent an, uh, uh, an envoy to see how Hezekiah was. And Hezekiah, in his pride, showed them all of the kingdom, all of his riches, the treasury, all these things. And what's fascinating in Second Chronicles, we, th we say, what's, what's the big deal about that? It was pride of heart. Self-dependence. I'm a great king. We just won this huge victory. And they had a, this great spiritual victory. And immediately on the heels, there's this testing time. Are you going to take credit for it? Or are you going to give credit to me? Are you going to stay loyal to me or not? And Second Chronicles chapter 32, verse 31 says this. So in the matter of the envoys of the princes of Babylon who had... Uh, been sent to him, to Hezekiah, to inquire about the sign that had been done in the land. The sign is that uh, uh, the uh, shadow went backwards. God, listen to this, 
God left him, Hezekiah, alone, left him to himself, in order to test him to know all that was in his heart. God left him alone, left him to himself, it says, in order to test him to know what was in his heart. Did God not know what was in his heart? Of course he did. God knows our thoughts before we think it. He knows our number of days before we even create. He knows all these things. So it wasn't for discovery purposes for God. He already knew. But it was that Hezekiah would realize his own character is what's going on here. But God left him alone. Time passes. And it seems like this is often something that God does. Here it says in verse 7 that at the end of 10 days, if you were, if, if, if they were like me, if I see something as urgent, I'm not thinking 10 days is, is a quick answer. Hey, we need to get out of here. Word can get back to Nebuchadnezzar very quickly. He can come kill us. I mean, the, the garrison is right over there. We could be dead people in just a matter of hours. Right? Lord, we need, to, we need an answer quick. We'll do whatever you want. Tell us what to do. But you've got to answer fast. That's how I'd be thinking. A day goes by. Okay. Oh, boy. Yeah, not surprised you didn't answer in one day. Second day. All right. Third day. Oh, boy. A week. Wouldn't you be chomping at the bit? Ten days. At the end of ten days. That's painful. We need an answer. Quick, now. But it's in these times it seems that God kind of lets us alone to, to reveal what's really going on. Because when there is disappointment and loss, and these folks had great disappointment, they've lost everything. Family, friends, nation, homes, lands, livelihoods, they're hungry. Disappointment and loss often reveal true character. And even though we know the right things to say and we start off well, when, we, when God withdraws his active hand and just lets us sit for a little while, what's on the inside comes out. Think tea bag. When the hot water pours in, what's on the inside of the tea bag comes out. You've heard that analogy before, right? And that's what he does. He's trying to deal with our character, giving us yet another chance to repent. So we wait. And we think. And we should. We think, and we should continue to pray. But what happens? We, in our humanity, we weigh our options, and that's exactly what they're doing. Stay, go to Egypt. Stay, go to Egypt. We weigh our options. What other choices are there? Now, we don't want to go north. The Assyrians have already captured and control Israel, so that's not an option. Egypt's the safest place. We'll look for another government to keep us safe, which, by the way, folks, Another friendly, friendly reminder, we don't rely upon a new president or a new government to help us. We rely upon God. We have good days no matter who's in the office. Our senators, representatives, doesn't matter, really. The Bible says that God has appointed them. So it doesn't matter. We, we cannot substitute government for God. And that's true with our jobs. That's true with our families. Our source of happiness, contentment, joy. God is the source of these things. We know these things to be true, but it's so easy for us to, to shift in this. So our brains are engaged. We weigh our options. We consider the ramifications. And their thinking is if we stay in, in Jerusalem, we're going to die. Nebuchadnezzar is going to come and kill us. If we go down to Egypt, we'll live. Well, this is kind of a no-brainer in my thinking, right? problem is we start focusing on our problems in that time that we wait. Yes, we're considering our options. We have the ramifications, but inevitably, we're problem solvers. And so we're thinking, how, what is the best move for us to come out well? And here's our problem issues. So we're focusing on our problems, and in the process then, we're feeding our fears. This is so totally human. You do this, I do this. Because we're looking at our problems instead of looking at our gods, we're feeding our fears instead of giving them to God and letting God take care of our fears. That's what's going on. 
So very often this time that God gives us, we are instead of running to God and just laying it at his feet, and when we struggle to take it up to, to put it back, we start working against ourselves. And we're going to look at that in a, in a few moments. We remember the past, and in this case, it's pretty easy for them to remember the past. Nebuchadnezzar just wiped out their country. It's very fresh in their minds. But they also evaluate, we evaluate our experiences. So what happened to me? What have I done? How have I come through all this? And stop and think about this for a second. God had warned the Israelites that he was going to send judgment, and he actually warned them uh, through the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, that he was going to use Nebuchadnezzar to do this. And yet the people are still resisting. God did it, and yet these folks are still alive on the other side of it. Let that sink in for a second. God has shown mercy to them. They're still alive. Is it an easy life? No, they're still hungry. There's still fear. They still lost everything, but they're alive. That's something. That's good. But they're not looking at some of these things. They evaluate their own experiences. I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit. In chapter 44, we are going to see that Jeremiah is confronting the people. We saw that they already had their intentions to go. They go ahead and leave, as we concluded there in verse 7. But now we're going to get a little bit of window into their thinking. Let's turn over to Je chapter 44 of Jeremiah. In verse 11, Therefore thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will set my face against you for harm. So now they're in Egypt, and God has sent Jeremiah to confront them yet again. And God's message is, Behold, I will set my face against you for harm to cut off all Judah. I will take the remnant of Judah who have set their faces to come to the land of Egypt to live, and they shall... All be consumed. We come down to verse 15. It says, Then all the men who went, uh, I'm sorry, who knew that their wives had made offerings to other gods, and all the women who stood by, a great assembly, all the people who lived in Pathros in the land of Egypt, answered Jeremiah, As for the word that you have spoken to us in the name of the Lord, we will not listen to you. But, we will do everything that we have vowed, making offerings to the queen of heaven and pour out drink offerings to her as we did, both we and our fathers, our kings and our officials in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem. Now listen to this. Here's their reasoning. For then, back in Jerusalem, when we were offering offerings to, the, to a different god, the queen of heaven, who isn't really a god, they think that she is. For then we had plenty of food and prospered and saw no disaster. But since we left off making offerings to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings to her, we have lacked everything and have been consumed by the sword and by famine. They've misinterpreted their circumstances. Do you see that there? When we were worshiping another god, it was going well with us. When we stopped, it didn't go well with us. She must be the real god, right? And Jeremiah is going to correct their thinking. We're going to, this is what's going on. In so doing, as we evaluate our own experiences, and here's the problem. We cannot base our spiritual choices on our experiences. We have to base our choices on God's word. Because the problem is we can misunderstand. We can misinterpret our circumstances. They just did. And Jeremiah is going to help them bring it into perspective. Verse 20, Jeremiah said to all the people, men and women, all the people who had given him this answer, as for the offerings that you offered in the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem, you and your fathers, your kings, your officials, and all the people in the land, did not the Lord remember them? Did it not come into his mind? And Jeremiah is not saying, yeah, wasn't God, wasn't, wasn't God happy with that? That's not what he's saying. The Lord could no longer bear your evil deeds and the abominations that you committed. Therefore, your land has been a desolation and a waste and a curse without inhabitant as it is this day. It is because 
you made offerings. And because you sinned against the Lord and did not obey the voice of the Lord and walk in his ways and in his statutes and in his, his testimonies, that this disaster has happened to you as at this day. You're misinterpreting things. You're offering to these false gods and you thought, we're at peace. We have plenty of food. No enemy. Life's good. When the prophets came and said, you can't do that. Quit this idolatry. You stop. Here comes the enemy. Bad. Okay, we're, we're doing something. No, 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 no. The enemy coming, you were doing the right thing by not offering sacrifices to another god, but what you're, you're misunderstanding God. God sent the enemy because you had been sinning this whole time. That's the problem. You're misinterpreting your circumstances. And so when we have time to think and pray and our brains are engaged as they are, we're thinking about our problems, what we're going to do, how this is going to affect our family. Instead of giving it to God, we play God. And that really leads us to this last point. So we pray, we wait, and then when the answer comes, we listen with our minds made up. Isn't that exactly what these folks are doing? Their mind is already made up before Jeremiah even comes back. In fact, Jeremiah, as he's answering them, already knows this. You guys are already sinning. You haven't even gone yet, and you're already guilty. We listen with our minds made up. We defy the commands of God, and that's exactly what chapter 42, verses 10 through 12 is talking about as Jeremiah is confronting them in this then. Uh, he's saying that uh, God is going to give them very clear commands that they are going to defy. So verse 10, if you will remain in this land, then I will build you up and not pull you down. I will plant you and, and not pluck you up. But what do you have to do? Remain in the land. That's the command. Obey me. Remain in the land. Don't fear the king of Babylon. You are. Stop. Don't. To fear him is to forget me. Can't do that. So there's commands given. They're defying it. They dismiss, dismiss the promises, the very blessings of God. And what were they? We just read them. I will plant you, he says. I will build you up and not pull you down. I will plant you and not pluck you up. And in this agricultural society, they got that. <laughs> they could see it. They've experienced it. We disregard the warnings of God. And indeed, God gave them warning after warning. Don't go to Egypt. You're going to die there if you go. But they disregarded it. But the real issue is that they discount God. Look at verse 11 of chapter 42. 42, verse 11. In the midst of this, he's saying, I'll build you up, not pull you down. Verse 11. Do not fear the king of Babylon, whom you are afraid. Do not fear him, declares the Lord. Why? For I am with you. God's all we need. I am with you to save you and to deliver you from his hand. I will grant you mercy that he may have mercy on you. I'm going to work. I'm in control. We read uh, several weeks ago on Wednesday night, God called Nebuchadnezzar his servant, interestingly enough. Nebuchadnezzar, my servant. Yes, he's going to do bad things. In fact, I'm going to bring judgment upon Nebuchadnezzar after all of this because of his sin. But he's actually my servant. Even in his sinful choices, I'm, I'm going to utilize him to bring about my judgment upon you in order to bring you back to myself, if you would listen, if you're not. And so by defying the commands, dismissing the promises, disregarding the warnings, the real issue, the heart of the issue is that they're discounting God. God's not enough to them. We'd rather safety under the protection of Pharaoh. We'd rather pray to these other gods. It worked for us. Well, so you thought. And that's the issue. They depend upon false gods. And in the, real the reality is that they deceive themselves. And so do we. We are so easily deceived, self-deceived. Our heart is desperately wicked, Jeremiah says. Who can know it? What are the four primary reasons for disobedience in our lives? We see actually many of them playing out here. Our own plans or pursuits. We have our own agenda. We have our own plan. We pray. 
But the reality is all we're doing is seeking God's stamp of approval upon what we've already decided to do. That's not praying. That's active rebellion. One of the reasons, the primary reasons for our disobedience is because we come with our own plans and our own pursuits in place when we pray. Another reason for disobedience, phobias. I'm going to stay with the P's. Fear, phobia. These guys were afraid of Nebuchadnezzar. They were afraid of famine. They didn't even like the sound of the trumpet. And that was because of they've been around soldiers so long. They've heard the enemies. They've heard their own. They've watched their own slain coming in. They're wounded, all these things. I don't even want to hear the sounds of war anymore. We fear hunger, trouble, pestilence, all these things. Sometimes we don't obey God because we're afraid. What it's going to cost us. What, it's going, what he's going to require of us. Sometimes it's just the unknown. And that's usually the biggest one. I don't know what's going to happen and it scares me. Yeah, but God does. Don't sweat it. It's in his hands. What's going to happen to our country? I don't know. Don't sweat it. It's in his hands. Isn't it easy for us to try to take action ourselves in our own humanity and our own wisdom? We mess it up. We're compounding the problem. Our own presumptions. We have an educated guess. I know it's going to happen. I know what happens if we stay. Nebuchadnezzar is going to come. And a lot of times our, our guesses are, certainly they're educated, and, and often they do come about. Not always. But as this text is so clearly showing, God's hand is upon Nebuchadnezzar. He cannot act without God's permission and blessing. He is a tool in the master's hand. And God can even change his heart to have mercy upon the Jews that he could very easily say, you're part of the rebels, kill them. You killed my governor, even though they didn't. I mean, communication can be pretty sketchy at times. So just get rid of the whole problem. But God controls even the heart of the enemy, of Nebuchadnezzar. The last one is pride. Very often we disobey God because of the own pride of our heart. And we see this, I pointed it out there in chapter 43, in verse 2 where it says, All the insolent men, why are they insolent from God's perspective? They thought they knew better than God. God said, don't. No, Jeremiah, you're lying. <laughs> you're lying. Actually, I didn't finish some of these things. I, I forgot E, if you were taking notes. We discredit the messenger of God. We, de we depend upon false gods. We deceive ourselves, E there. So when Jeremiah told them the truth, they discredit the messenger. No, you're lying. It wasn't God who spoke. It was Barak who, who was guiding you. And by the way, your intentions are bad. Barak is telling you this so that will be destroyed at the hand of Nebuchadnezzar or be taken captive over into Babylon. So it's pride. They think they know better than God. Look at chapter 44 and verse 10. It says, They have not humbled themselves even to this day, as God is confronting those that have now moved down to Egypt. And In fact, verse 9. Have you forgotten the evil of your fathers, the evil of the kings of Judah, the evil, uh, evil of their wives? your own evil, the evil of your wives, which they committed in the land of Judah and in the streets of Judah, Jerusalem. They have not humbled themselves. Sin is an act of pride and rebellion against God. It's usurping his authority. It's usurping his, an attempt to usurp his deity. We want to be the God of our lives. And part of repentance is humbling of ourselves. They have not humbled themselves even to this day, nor have they feared. Where's the fear of God? Part of fear of God is, is humility, letting God make the choices for our lives. Not walking in my law and my statutes that I sent before you and before their fathers. So pride, another major factor in why we don't obey God. We think we know better. We think we can navigate life a little more effectively than what God has us, the path that God has. What are the four, uh, four primary results of disobedience? Obviously, from this text, we see that divine disablement. 
And that's kind of a sobering thing to say. God steps in, divine, and he disables our plans. He dismantles them. Why? Because he hates us that much? No, actually because he loves us that much. He does not want us to self-destruct, but rather he's giving them time and uh, again an opportunity to turn and repent. Did you notice there that it said that he persen persistently sent his prophets to them? Verse 4 of chapter 44. Yet I persistently, the word there in the Hebrew is early in the morning I sent. I always sent early in the day, but in the process of your sin choices. I'm sending you early to try to prevent this. You're not listening. Yet I persistently sent to you all my servants, the prophets, saying, Oh, do not do this abomination that I hate. But they did not listen or incline their ear to turn from their evil and to make no offerings to other gods. D divine disablement. God works against us to stop us in our tracks, to bring about repentance. The next primary result of disobedience I'm going to stay with the D's instead of <laughs> dread, fear. It's fear again. Uh, we often don't obey God because of our fear, but one of the things, uh, the results of disobedience is fear. We live in fear. Remember we talked about Lot last week. Lot said, I don't, don't make me leave. I can't flee to the hill countries because of the disaster, the calamity. God's judgment might catch up to me. Let me go to Zor. Isn't it a little one? All right, the angels let him go to Zorar. He goes there. He doesn't stay along. He leaves. Why? Because he was afraid to live in Zoar. So where did he go to live? In a cave with his daughters. Unreal. We think we're getting what we want. We're going to be safe, content. It's going to be good. No more fear. Guess what? Fear comes. Why? You're outside of God's umbrella of protection. Same thing as here. He, God time again said, the thing that you're afraid of, so 42, verse 16, then the sword that you fear shall overtake you there. The famine of which you are afraid shall fo follow close after you to Egypt. And there you shall die. One of the results of our disobedience is compounded fear. Greater fear. Realized fear. Destruction is the, th is the third one. And this is actually self-imposed destruction. This is so totally avoidable. Our messes in our lives, so, so avoidable if we would let God be God. Oh, we get in our scrapes and things go badly. I'm not saying that everything is peaches and cream when we obey God. It's difficult. But at least it's not necessarily of our own making. But this is of their own making. Look at chapter 44, verse uh, 7. It says this, Now thus says the Lord God of of hosts, the God of Israel, why do you commit this great evil against yourselves? You're worshiping other gods and you think it's helping you? Do you know what? You're actually doing this against yourselves. Do you remember what we talked about last week? Lot was a victim of his own choices. Now, he didn't choose to be violated by his daughters. In fact, earlier in the, in the text there in, G in Genesis chapter um, 19, he offered his daughters, they were, they were his victims, offering them to the bad guys, right? Without going into too much detail. And in so doing, and in a, a lifetime of tolerating sin, he's teaching his daughters how to think and how to act. And so now it's going to work against him they're going to get him drunk for certain purposes, and he does things he doesn't even realize or know that he's doing. He is now the victim of the choices that he's made all throughout his life, facilitating and teaching his children. All that's happening is that his daughters were thinking the same way he thought. They chose the way, same way that he chose, made decisions in life. And that's what Jeremiah here is saying. You make your choices... And to you, they seem logical, but actually you're destroying yourselves. Self-destruction. And I'm here, I'm sending my prophets to stop you. Listen! But you don't. And ultimately, death is the ultimate result of disobedience. In fact, that's exactly what Satan wants, right? He is the author of confusion. 
the accuser of the brethren, the author of lies, and he's the destroyer is what he's called. He wants death. So all these things come into play here in our simple little decision in this crisis moment. Lord, show us what we should do, where we should go, what we should do. Sounds pretty good, right? Problem is, we all know the right things to say. But often, we've already made up our minds how we're going to obey. And it's to our own undoing. And it affects not just us, but the next generation. In fact, the next generations. Look around, our country is a victim of its own choices. Where's the respect for authority? Why are police officers our enemies? They're not here, thankfully. And they're not in the majority of America, I'm convinced. Why is what's going on in Portland even happening these days? Why are we calling evil good and good evil? Why are prisoners being released that are guilty and innocent people are being imprisoned? Everything's upside down right now. It's because choices, hard choices, weren't made years ago. Parents weren't parenting, biblically. Oh, you're parenting. Folks, it's so easy to be passive in our leadership, not just in the parenting role. Guys, this is for us. It is so easy for us to be passive husbands, passive leaders, to take the least path of resistance. Leave me alone. I've had a hard day at work. I'm tired. Children come. People come. Spouse sometimes, hey, needs your advice. Eh. And so your counsel's not there, and they make the decision that seems right in the moment. And guys, just like your and my decisions, without sometimes with a lot of thought, sometimes with not so, so much thought. Guys, we make lousy decisions, and guess what? Sometimes our family makes lousy decisions. And that's why God designs a family. A man needs a wife. A wife needs a husband, leadership. It's a team. We're incomplete. When God made Adam and Eve, when he made Adam, he saw that it was not good that he was alone. He needed to help meet, right? We're a team. No one makes great decisions all the time. But the reality is, guys, the buck stops at you. God placed leadership on your shoulders. And when we lead passively, in other words, when we don't lead, our wives will take up the slack. Our children will take up the slack. America's in the shape that she's in today because many came off of the battlefield. They were tired of fighting World War II. They were excited to come home and have a family. I mean, many of those were boys when they came, or when they went to war. They're coming back still pretty young. From our perspective, still boys. They just want peace. They want their family to be happy because they've had to grow up and see things that no person should have to see. And they take the easy way out. Many of them not knowing God. And I'm, I'm categorizing. Not, a, not all the soldiers did this, of course. But most of them, of course, didn't know Christ. So instead of finding their hope and strength and purpose and rebuilding their lives in Christ, they turned to the bottle. How many stories do you read of heroes coming back from war and they have tormented marriages, child abuse, all these different things? PTSD wasn't even a term back then. They didn't know how to deal with some of these things, flashbacks and all these things. And so bottle was the easiest choice, the least passive resistance. At least they could escape some of their horrors for a few hours at the expense of everybody else. With that, then, there came a love for fun by the next generation. And those coming out of war wanted their children to have fun, not know the struggles that they did. Not a bad thing altogether, but when that becomes our primary goal, that's problematic. Where's God in this thinking, or in our thinking? And so there's a generation that grew up, by and large, 
without God, without biblical thinking. In fact, during this time, they're trying to remove God from schools, from prayer, introduce free love, anything goes. Authority being attacked way back in the 60s. Soldiers coming back, being spat upon when they merely followed orders. And it just snowballs and snowballs and snowballs. It starts in the home, guys. Moms, your children need parents, not another friend. They need leaders. And I point this out because it seems explicit in this text, especially as we come to 44. And again, it sounds like we're throwing our wives under the bus. Not at all. The guys are guilty in this as well. But it seems like, as we saw with, with um, we see it with Adam and Eve. Eve listened to the voice of his wife instead of to God. Abraham listened to the voice of Sarah, his wife. Took Hagar instead of listening to God saying, no, the seed's going to be from your uh, offspring, from you, your wife. Uh, we see it uh, probably taking place with Lot. We discussed that he may have taken his wife from Sodom and Gomorrah. Uh, we're seeing it here. There's a factor where you're elevating your family above God. And it's not the very blessing of God. So wives aren't bad. They're a blessing from God. And yet when we in our own lives, guys, husbands and wives, when God's not first and foremost, we can offer bad advice. We can want bad things. And so in 40, chapter 44, verse 9, have you forgotten the evil of your fathers, the evil of the king, kings of Judah? And it's so interesting that, they, that Jeremiah, God, actually highlights the sin of the king's wives. Why? Do you remember Solomon? He turned from God in his old age. Why? In order to please his wives. He had a, a 300 wives, 700 concubines, and he made ho houses, but even more than that, temples for their God, and he actually worshiped with his wives in their temples to foreign gods. Why? To keep peace in the home, it seems. And that carried on. Ahab married Jezebel. Great influence upon him. Now, that was Israel. This is, of course, Judah. But their wives are involved in this, it says. The evil of their wives. Your own evil, guys, and the evil of your wives that they committed. Let me show you one other thing here. Go down to verse 19. So he confronts them. They respond, no, when we worshiped our God, it went well. Uh, the, the God of the Queen of Heaven, it went well for us. When we stopped, it went badly for us. But notice verse 19. And the women said, so they're responding to Jeremiah. When we made offerings to the Queen of Heaven and poured out our drink offerings at, uh, to her, was it without her husband's approval that we made cakes for, for, her, for, her bearing her, for her, bearing her image and pouring out drink offerings to her? Hey, we did this with our husband's knowledge. With his approval, in fact. What's going on? Guys weren't leading their homes. That's what's going on. They took the easy way out. Keep peace in the home. God understands where they should have led. What's the remedy for us? It's so easy for us. We want safety. We want the absence of trouble in our own lives and also for our family. Don't we? We want security. We want the presence of possessions, provisions, food, water, and all these other things. These are not bad things necessarily. We want the acceptance of others. We want to have a good reputation in our community. God tells us to have one, to seek it. That's not a bad thing. But when these things trump God in his way, that's when it becomes problematic. These People wanted safety on their terms instead of safety found in God. They wanted provisions of their own making or by the provision of a foreign government, Egypt, as opposed to from God. They wanted acceptance of the peers. I wonder if Jehonan and the, the, the other guy wanted to go down to Egypt just to keep the peace there with the counsel that he was receiving from those that he helped rescue. I don't know. Sometimes we want the, we're satisfied with peace in the ranks instead of peace with our, our God. 
We'd rather be happy than holy. We'd rather be healthy than holy. The remedy, repent from our sin and commit to obeying God. We talked about a Daniel entering into this. A Daniel, of course, purposed in his heart that he would not defy God. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, did they have an easy life? They were in a foreign government that was very pagan. And that yet they maintained a beautiful testimony. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego cast into what? A fiery furnace, heated seven times. The guys that were going to throw them in, their toughest soldiers, died because it was so hot. What happened to them? They were tied up, thrown in, but when they landed, the ropes burned off, but they stood up, walked around, and there was one like the Son of God walking. It seems like there was a Christophany, Jesus appearing in human form before his actual coming to earth as a child, right? God intervened. Was it easy? No, that's gutsy. It's hard. But God's in control. They made right decisions in spite of the heat of the moment. Daniel, thrown into the lion's den simply because he was not allowed to pray to his God for 30 days. Psh. I don't care what the edict is. I can't disobey God. The decision was made years ago. And when the tough time came, the time that often reveals true character, his true character had already been developed years ago as a teenager, young child, growing up, consistently doing the right thing. And so when the heat was poured on, what came out was just, this is how it is. I can't. There, it, there is not an option to disobey God. Can't do it. Not even considered. Come what may. All right, so I die. So I'm going to be a, instead of a Scooby snack, I'm going to be a lion snack. Oh, well, what happened? God shut their mouths, the mouths of the lions. In fact, the very people that had them put in, Nebuchadnezzar cast them to be thrown in. And they were, I calculated it once. I don't think I've written it in this Bible. I think there was uh, um, over 300 people probably that were cast in. I think there were 90 uh, princes, if they were married with children, that's close to 300 people that were thrown into the lion's den, and the Bible says that they were ripped apart before they even hit the floor. That's how hungry, that's how vicious they were. Daniel, I bet you he cuddled up and slept pretty well next to a warm lion that night. Not a scratch. In our nation, in our country, we have to be very careful to realize that the enemy is not those who oppose us. Usually the biggest enemy is the one we see in the mirror. Me. You. We're, we are our own worst enemy because we try to play God, take matters in our own hands. We have to do it God's way. Are you committed to that? Are you committed to obeying the Lord unconditionally, completely, continually this year. I pray we are. Let's pray. Father, certainly a difficult text, so much here, and we just kind of grazed over the highlights of it. And even in that, it took a bit of time. Thank you for patient, hungry hearers. But, Lord, we want to be more than just hearers of your word. We want to be doers of it. We want to obey you. We want to be your go-to people. When you need something done, you can turn to us. And by your grace, with your faithfulness and your enablement, we'll get her done the right way every time. Father, it's easy to grow weary in well-doing, hence the command to not allow ourselves to, to do that. It's easy to be fearful and the world that we live in. It's easy to be passive, to go with the flow. And especially as times are going to crank up, the heat is going to be poured on, it's going to be easy for us just to, to be silent, to maintain the status quo, to blend in. When in fact, you're calling us to be Daniels and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's. You're calling us to be like Jesus, who was willing to be wronged even unto death. And while certainly we realize that 
Jesus is the means of our salvation. We play no part in that other than receiving his free gift uh, as our own. Uh, we realize that you are calling us to be like him, to love our enemies, realizing that the enemy is actually Satan, the one who deceives. And so, Father, may we be a people that are not deceived. Would you help us to study hard in these days while we still have the privilege of holding your word in our hands? May we pray long for our families, for our children, that they would stand strong, that they would develop godly character. Lord, I pray for our dads and our moms. I pray, first of all, that they would enjoy sweet times of communion with you. Would you bless them in their quiet time? Would you bless them in their thinking and pondering your word as applied to their, their situations where they're at, work situations, family situations? Lord, I pray for marriages. That they would be strong, built upon Jesus Christ, that they would look like the relationship of Christ and his church. Help our men to love their wives as Christ loves the church. Help our wives, as Paul directs, to with reverence submit that others would see Christ in us. I pray for our children that they would not just know what to do, but why we do what we do. I pray that moms and dads would have wisdom in instructing and discipling and disciplining, that we would not just create a generation that does out of fear of punishment or just because that's what mom and dad make me do, but when we get off on, on to my own, I'm doing it my own way. Instead, Father, I pray that you'd raise up the next generation that, that wants to make choices out of love for you, fear for your great name, reverence for your word and a desire to be distinct from this world. So, Father, I pray that you would build up, as you stated that you would to the folks of Judah, that you would build them up and not tear them down. You would plant them and not uproot them. Lord, would you build up families in this ministry, build up our marriages, build up our family units, build up our work relationships. Make them strong and durable. May they last. Plant us deep. Water us well from thy word. May we be a people that act according to our calling as we are called by your name. So we give ourselves to you. Grow us and mature us. Help us to be the light of the world in this very dark time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for your kind attention. I have already gone quite late. So we're going to forego the song. Let's stand and uh, make sure you communicate the love of Christ to one another. You are dismissed. <laughs>